Now, I'm going to be dealing with a biblical passage that is at the very heart of the Adventist church. And if you have a Bible near you, I will encourage you to go and open the scripture in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. What I'm going to do is to comment, share with you what I found in these passages. This, these verses contain the, the message and the mission of the church. So the, this, this passage is at the very heart of Adventism. And in order for you to proclaim the message there, you have to understand the message. So I hope I can help you uh, open up the text so that you can see there the beauty of the passage. Now, let me first, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, provide a, in a few minutes the, the context of, of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Then I'm going to share with you my approach to the text. How am I going to be reading the text? And finally, I'm going to make a few comments about each one of the three messages to open up what I think is the beauty of the passage. So let me begin with the literary setting. The passage, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, is part of the central section of the book. This section begins in chapter 11, verse 19. And I want you to remember that, 11, 19. Uh, John is taken to the heavenly sanctuary, to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And then the rest of the passage from 12 to 15 is about the cosmic conflict, particularly the cosmic conflict at the time of the end, the closing of the cosmic conflict, something wonderful. There. Finally, the conflict is going to end. This is what the passage is, is talking about. Chapter 12 describes the conflict between the dragon Jesus on earth, the church during the Middle Ages, and it closes in verse 17, 1217. The dragon is going to get ready to attack the remnant. And in chapter 13, you see the dragon getting together his team. Yes, he has a team. He's going to use the beast from the sea. He's going to use the beast from the earth. And he's going to bring them together for a final attack against the remnant. And in chapter 13, verses 18, you, they are ready to attack the people of God. There is a death decree. And the people of God is going to be exterminated. Then in chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, tells you they will not be able to exterminate God's people because God's people are spiritually speaking under the protection of God and the land on Mount Zion. They are untouchable. And the question is how, how the people of God got there. And there comes our passage, the three angels' messages. Through the three angels' messages, God has gathered his end time remnant and he's going to use them and he's going to protect them. Now, with this in mind, let's go now to my approach and immediately into the text. I read this passage many times. For many years, I've been reading this passage, but in the, during the last uh, seven, eight months, I've been reading the passage very carefully. And I realized that this passage, in order for us to understand it, we have to read it from a Christological perspective. Let me explain. A Christological perspective means that we are going to see what this text 
14, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, says about Jesus and his work. And then what it says about us and our work. Are we together now? If you read the first message, the beginning of the first message, you have this angel and he is doing one thing. The text says he is proclaiming the eternal gospel. So that the first topic that is thrown at the church, that is thrown at us, is the gospel. This is extremely important because this is the first thing. So the messages are about the gospel. And now what is the gospel? Well, I'm going to say a few things about that. But for now, let me say this. The gospel is the good news that we were lost. The father sent the son who was incarnated ministered to us revealing the love of God and then died in your place and in my place. And he was resurrected and ascended to heaven to be our high priest before the father. And then he will come back for us. This is a summary of the gospel. This is good news. So this angel is proclaiming the gospel to the whole world. Now, look, this is the first, verse 6. Now, if you go to verse 12, verse 12, the first verse, 6, the last verse, 12. You go at verse 12. What is it that it says? It speaks about who are the people of God. And it says that they, 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 ha they keep the commandments of God and they have placed their faith in the saving work of Christ. Did, did you see it? It takes you back to Christ as our savior. It takes you back to the biblical idea that we are saved through Christ, through faith. So you have the gospel at the beginning, the gospel at the end, kind of book ends of the message. This is the message. Now, if you go to the second message, I'm going to suggest to you that the Babylon is proclaiming a false gospel. And the true gospel is going to be triumphant. Now, if you go to the third message, which, oh, the third message is a little difficult. Yeah? But if you go to the third message in verse 10, there is a reference to the Lamb of God. The Lamb. Keep that in mind. So let's us, let us begin. The gospel, verse 6, is proclaiming the gospel throughout the world. Do you know who the angel is, who three, these three angels are? We, the remnant people of God, as who we are. And we are proclaiming the gospel, the eternal gospel. Eternal gospel. Do you know why it is called eternal because it was formulated in the divine mind in eternity. And it was kept there in the divine mind as a secret, a mystery. And when Christ came, the gospel was manifested to the world. It's eternal. It's eternal because there's no other. It's eternal because the eff eff efficacy of the death of Christ is eternal. It's eternal because you cannot change it. You may try to change it, but it will remain forever. It's eternal in its consequences. You accept the gospel, you will live forever. You reject the gospel, you will be exterminated forever. You will die forever. So this, this is a very important thing. Now, notice that the angel does not explain what the eternal gospel is. Did you notice that? It simply says, proclaiming the eternal gospel. And then you have to ask yourself, what, what is this gospel? Then you go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is going to tell you what is this eternal gospel. And it uh, shows up in the first chapter of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 5. John is giving greetings to the churches 
and in, in, in the greetings, he mentions Christ. And, and he says, he liberated us, redeemed us through his blood from our sins. See the gospel right there at the beginning. He loves us and he liberated us from our sins through his blood. So you have the idea of Christ's sacrifice liberating us from death. You go to chapter 5. Now, this is important. Listen carefully. Chapter 5. The first time that the lamb shows up. The first time. The, the, the angels are saying, who's worthy to open the book that the father has in his hands? And they hear a voice saying, the lion of Judah. The Messiah. Look at him. He's going to take the book. And, and when John turns, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb that was slain. The lamb that was slain. And when the heavenly beings see him in chapter 9, they shout and they say, he is worthy. Satan is not worthy. The fallen cherub is not worthy to sit on the throne. The lamb that was slain. Because through his blood he redeemed us. That's what verse 10 says. This is the gospel, the good news. We were lost in our sins and the lamb came and died for us. Saved us. We belong to the heavenly family. Good news. In the book of Revelation. The lamb is the embodiment of the gospel. The lamb takes us to the cross where he revealed God's love from, for us and died for us. This figure, we cannot have, don't have time to go through the passages, but this important figure plays a key role in the book of Revelation. God defeated Satan, the dragon, and he will defeat him at the end, not through the sword, but through the lamb who died, through the sacrifice of the lamb. This is the good news. This is the message that you and I, we together, are to proclaim to the world. Now, verse 7 takes us into what I call the altar call. The message is the gospel, now comes the altar call. And you have three imperatives. Fear God, give him glory, and worship him. This is the call. That at the end of your sermon, you tell people, do this. And I'm going to go through this quickly because of the Mark Finley will deal with this a little more carefully. The first fear God. Fear God it means that, that uh, let me put it this way. To fear God assumes that this being whom we call God is unique. That there is no one like him. That he is essentially different from the creature. And when he appears, he's enshrouded in light and glory, impenetrable light. The earth shakes, smoke of his presence go up to the sky. It's a very powerful God who should not be confused with a creature. And when humans saw his presence, they were afraid because they could not control him. He is God, the creator of the cosmos, unique. And their human reaction, not only because we're creatures, but because we're sinners, the natural human reaction is fear. And then in the Old Testament, 
they hear this magnificent God speaking to the people. And what he says to them is this. I want to be you, God. And I want you to be my people. A loving God. To fear God is to accept this call to be God's people. And the fear is manifested now not in running away from him. It's manifested in submission to him, in obedience to his will. So the angel is telling the human race, do not fear human beings. Do not fear the dragon. Do not submit to them. Submit to the most majestic being in the cosmos and outside the cosmos, God, submit to him. The second is give him glory. See the phrase, give him glory. It doesn't say glorify him, although that idea is also present. It says give him glory. This phrase is used in, in the Old Testament several times. When you get a copy of the paper, you will have all the passages and everything. It's used in the Old Testament several times. And, and it's used in, in, in occasion in the context of, of a sinner who is going to be punished and who give glory. It's ordered to give glory to God before the execution. And what does that mean, to give glory to God? The phrase itself, well, I'm going to tell you briefly what it means. To give glory to God is to acknowledge that God is a righteous and loving judge and that I am a sinner and I deserve whatever the judge decides to give me. Did you get the idea? To give glory to God. We give glory to God. When we say, God, you are a righteous and loving judge, and I am a sinner, I am a sinner, I deserve to die. And then the Lord says to me, look at the lamb. There is forgiveness for you. And we experience the love of God. So this angel is saying, to the human race, accept the biblical God as your God and submit to him. Acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you deserve whatever is coming your way and declare that God is a righteous and loving God. Declare before the universe that Lucifer is wrong when accusing God of being unjust and loveless Declare before the universe, God is indeed a loving God and a righteous God. In other words, join in the cosmic war, join the Lamb. Why? Because the hour of God's judgment is here. In the Old Testament, the, the, the type, the symbol of the day of judgment was the day of atonement. The Day of Atonement represented the final judgment. In chapter 11, verse 19, at the beginning of this whole section, John was taken into the most holy place. This happened during the Day of Atonement. And in that verse, 19, 11, it was really being told the Day of Judgment is coming. The Day of Atonement is coming. Now, in chapter 14, verse 7, the angel says, the day of atonement, the day of judgment is already here. The hour, the moment when the day of atonement had to begin is here. And you have to connect that to Daniel, chapter 8, which provides for us the time 
when the final judgment, the Day of Atonement, was to begin in 1844. The judgment. The judgment is revelatory. It, it displays something. It displays the truth. Judgment is a search for the truth. It displays the truth. And what is the truth that is displayed is going to be displayed in the final judgment. Listen, that God is a loving and righteous God. That's what the judgment will reveal. Good news, wonderful news, great news. And the last part of the call is to worship God, the creator. You see that? He created everything. In fact, the, 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 the angel is, is almost quoting Exodus 20, verse 11. The fourth commandment. So he's saying you have to worship God. Do not worship the beast or the dragon. Worship God. Why? Because he created everything and he gave us a memorial of his creation, a memorial of what he did, the Sabbath. This is going to be a topic of debate as we close the cosmic conflict, the Sabbath. the seal of God. Those who are with the Lord are identified and protected by him. They have the seal and they worship God. What does it mean? It means that they have, that they have the joy in gratitude for what the Lamb has done for them. They have the joy of bowing down before the source of life, surrendering their lives every day, every week in worship and service to him. Now, let me, let me, I, I can't say much more, but let me go to the second uh, message. The second message is about the fall of Babylon. The fall of Babylon. It's good news. I mean, the enemy is going to fall. So this is good news. It's not bad news. And the Lord is trying to persuade uh, the, 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 the dwellers uh, uh, of the earth to take his side in the cosmic conflict, not the side of the dragon, but his side. And he's telling them, listen, you don't want to be on the side of the losers. Babylon is going to fall. Take the side of the winners. This is a good advice. Babylon is going to fall. What is this? What is Babylon? To go to, go to Genesis 11. The first time that, that Babylon is, is mentioned in the Bible. Can you hear me? This is the first time. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's described there as the human attempt to survive on his own or their own. That's what is happening there. After the flood, they said, we don't want, we cannot trust in God any longer. We're going to survive by our own. And we're going to create, we're going to make this tower that will join the earth with heaven. This is a, a, an ambition that is unbelievable. This is one of the greatest ambitions that a human being could have, or a creature could have, to have dominion over earth and heaven, control.
This is the spirit of Babylon. Self-preservation. Rejection of God. Now, if you want to read more about what Babylon is, then you have to go to Isaiah chapter 14. Yeah, you remember the passage? This is the passage about the fallen cherub. Lucifer. It's a chapter about Babylon, the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is represented there as promoting the agenda of the fallen cherub. The fallen cherub wanted to be like God and go up to the heavenly temple and establish himself there to be worshipped. Now, this was also the intention of Babylon, the king, because he was the instrument of the dragon. promoting the agenda of the dragon. Now, at the end, the dragon is going to create another Babylon. This is not a literal city. No? I'm going to tell you what Babylon is. Listen, Babylon is a false trinity and is formed by three elements. The true trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the dragon is going to imitate God. He's going to try to be like God. So he's going to create a trinity, a false trinity. The first person in his trinity is the beast from the ocean. Chapter 13, verse 1. The beast that comes. Who is this beast? Well, this beast is the church during the Middle Ages. The church apostate church during the middle ages he's going to is wounded in chapter 13 is is wounded so the dragon has to take her and and, uh, and and heal the beast then there is another beast coming from the earth chapter 13 verse 18 and on uh, who is this beast well this beast represents apostate protestantism represented by North America. And the third element is the dragon himself. Spiritualism grounded in the idea, the pagan idea of the immortality of the soul. These three powers, the dragon, Protestant, apostate Protestants, apostate Christianity, they will come together as one, the new Babylon. What is it that the dragon is doing with this new Babylon? He is going to unify apostate Christianity with their apostate message. And he's going to universalize this apostate message. Chapter 16, Verse 13 and 14, remember? And from the mouth of the dragon came three demonic spirits, the three. In chapter 14, you have three angels coming from heaven proclaiming the gospel. You have the, you have the contrast there, two global messages. One under the leadership of a false trinity, the other under the leadership of Christ, the Lamb, the false trinity. What is it that the false trinity is proclaiming? The text says that the, 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 the Babylon gave to the dwellers of the earth her wine. Now listen, her wine. And they drank the wine and get intoxicated, followed Babylon. What is this wine? You remember Jesus, the last supper with the disciples? He took the wine, you remember? And he said to the disciples, drink. This is my blood through which you will be redeemed, saved. This is the gospel. Huh? The wine is, is the work, Christ's work of salvation. Gave it to us. 
Now at the end, this false Babylon comes and looks at, at, at humanity and tells them, I have a new wine for you. Drink it. False teachings, the apostasy of Christianity. Do you know what, who Babylon is? Babylon is the segment of the Laodicean church who rejected the invitation of Christ to be enriched by the gospel and to wear the crop of righteousness of Christ. In chapter 18, Revelation 18, Babylon says, I have rich, I don't need anything, and I have beautiful, wonderful dresses. The rejection of the gospel. The rejection of the gospel. Babylon is going to fall. The gospel is going to be triumphant. Chapter 17, verse 14. It says, and, and, and this false trinity, uh, they, they're going to fight against the lamb and the lamb will defeat them. Who is the lamb? Is the lamb is Jesus Christ with his message of salvation, the gospel. The gospel will defeat Babylon. Now let's go to the last message. The last message is, is, is a warning, warning. God is very concerned about the future of the human race. And he's warning with, with, with tears in his eyes, I would say, telling them, please do not take the number and the, be and the name of the beast. Please don't do that. In other words, do not align yourself with the agenda of the dragon and the two beasts. Don't do that. Do not worship them. You see, the first message was worship God. In this third message is do not worship the beast. Do not submit to them. It doesn't matter what they will threaten you with. Don't do it. Do not take the name of the number. You know, to take the name, this has to do with identity, to identify, to take the character of the beast and the dragon. Don't, don't, don't take, don't, don't be like them. They promise you that if you have, if you take the name and the mark, they will protect you and you will not die. Don't believe them. Don't take the name or the mark that will identify you as servants of the dragon and the beast someday. Someday. Now, someday was a, a, a very significant demonic invention. Listen, very significant. See, Satan had, has had two main goals. Lucifer has had two main goals. The first one is he wanted to change God's law. Because according to him, God's laws, law was unjust, unloving. And he wanted to be worshipped as God because God was not a loving God. Now, how could he achieve that? And he came up with a demonic, brilliant idea. If I can achieve both things by doing one thing, it would be wonderful. And he did it. He went to the fourth commandment and he changed the day of rest and in doing that he became the object of worship let me explain Sunday 
is not a false day of worship. It's that, but it's not mainly that. The same way that the Sabbath is, yes, the right day of worship, but it's much more. What is the Sabbath? The right day, not only of rest, but of worship. You, you follow me? Sabbath is the right day of rest and worship. Sunday is the wrong day of rest and worship. You see what he did? By changing Sabbath to Sunday, he at the same time was becoming the object of worship. Because that's the day when his followers would worship him. One action, one change, accomplished both things, changed the law and became the object of worship. And this is going to be a very important issue as we approach the end. Do not identify yourself with the agenda of the dragon. Why? Because I am going, this is what the message says, I am going to take the beast and his followers, the dragon and his followers to court, to court. I'm going to take them to the final judgment. And this is a serious matter, this is very serious. Stay loyal to me and, 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 and you don't have to go through the punishment of the last judgment. They are going to experience the wrath of God. Yes, the wrath of God. Oh, but what is that? Well, see, the angel is going to try to explain to John what is the wrath of God. Now, if, don't, don't do anything else now. Listen to me during the last few minutes, okay? Listen and concentrate. What is this wrath? The angel is going to explain to John what the wrath is. And he uses two metaphors, two illustrations. The first one is wine. Did you notice that? The wrath of God is like wine. But it is wine that is extremely intoxicating. And that is not mixed with water. That was the practice at that time. They, they mixed wine with water to have a little more and to have a little more liquid. But in some cases, they wanted it to have to have a higher degree of intoxication. Intoxication, so they added they added spices. Was so intoxicated that people fell down. Babylon falling. What is the point of this metaphor, of this image, of this symbol? What is the point? God's wrath is like wine that has not been mixed with water. In other words, God wrath is not going to be mixed with mercy. In the final judgment, God's wrath is not going to be mixed with mercy. In other words, there's not going to be room for repentance. That's what it means. Wrath without mercy means no chance for repentance is gone. Okay, that's the first metaphor. The second one is fire and brimstone or, or, or sulfur. The wrath of God is like fire or burning, burning sulfur, brimstone. What does that mean? What is this image communicating? It is communicating two things. The first one is that the wrath of God is very painful. 
it's very painful. Now listen to this, stay with me, because we're going somewhere. The wrath of God is very painful. It's as painful, and this is the illustration, as when burning sulfur falls on your skin, <laughs> extremely painful. He says, this is, this is the wrath of God is painful. And the second point of this metaphor is that the wrath of God will result in eternal death, eternal death. Did you hear me? The wrath of God will result in eternal death. Why is this image communicating? How is this image communicating eternal death? Very simple. What you burn is destroyed forever. Take a piece of wood, you burn it, what you have is ashes. You will never be able to recover the wood. It's gone forever. So the wrath of God is painful and will result in the eternal death of the wicked. This is the image here. The wrath of God is without mercy. It's going to be painful. And it's going to result in eternal death. And this idea of, of of pain is intensified when John says that the wicked will be tormented. Tormented. Pain, excruciating pain. Intense pain. Pain over which they have no control because that was torment means. No control over the pain. And they are going to go through that pain for a period of time is not defined. The period of time is not defined there. They're going to go through this pain. And here is the question now, listen to me. This is something you have to think about. Listen to me very carefully. What is causing this pain? Here, I want you to look carefully. At verse 10, they will be tormented before in the presence of the angels and Christ. Are you ready? Now, this is a very controversial phrase, tormented before the angels and Christ. And scholars, not having the scholars, have been struggling with the meaning of this phrase. And they have different opinions. They all agree that this is a, a judgment. This isn't the final judgment. When the wicked are going to, to be punished, you know, they, 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 they're going to be tormented. But, but what does it mean that it's done before the angels and Christ? And I uh, struggle with this phrase. I talked to the Lord about this phrase. I said, I don't know what, what to do with this phrase, but it gives him it gives the impression that the wicked are being burning alive and the dragon and the, the Jesus and the angels are looking at them rejoicing. But this is not what the image is about. So I said to the Lord, Lord, you help me, help me do this. And in the night, I woke, I, I woke up during the night when working this paper, and I was saying, what is this? And all of a sudden, poof, it came. I realized that the phrase, the angels and Christ, is language used in the New Testament to describe the second coming of Christ. Are, are you listening? Christ is coming with his angels. The second coming of Christ is the apparition of Christ with his angels. 
And it hit me. What John is saying is that during the final judgment, Christ is coming to appear before the wicked and Satan is, is going to appear to them. John is, use, is borrowing the language of the second coming to tell us in the final judgment there's going to be one more appearing of parousia. Christ will come and appear before the wicked. But I want you to listen carefully at what the text says. You see, the text doesn't say the angels and Christ. The text doesn't say the angels and the Lord, the angels and the Messiah. The text says the angels and the Lamb. The Lamb. Who is the Lamb? The Lamb that was slain. When Christ appears before the wicked, they will see the cross, the cross of Jesus. They will see the Son of God dying for them and for you and for me. This is the good news. They will look at Jesus, the Lamb who sacrificed himself for them. And when looking at Jesus, they will see themselves as they are. Cedars in open rebellion against this most loving God hanging on the cross. The Lamb. It's no way for them to hide from themselves. They see themselves as they are. You remember Isaiah chapter 6? This is a good case. Isaiah saw the Lord and the, immediately their reaction was, woe of me, I'm going to die, I'm a sinner. When the wicked will see the Lamb, they will see themselves as they are. They will see the cross as the majestic display of the love of God to the cosmos. They will see that God is indeed a God of love and justice. And this is what is causing the pain. It's almost a paradox. It's a contradiction, almost a contradiction. <laughs> The, the love of God that causes the unfolding beings throughout the cosmos to rejoice. The love of God that makes us praise him and be grateful to him for his salvation. That same love causes indescribable pain in the wicked. Because they finally realize that they are lost. That they could have spent eternity with this most loving God had they accepted the offer of salvation through the Lamb. But they rejected it. And now they know that they are going to be eternally separated from this most wonderful and loving God. And it causes indescribable pain. Do you have any doubt? If you have any doubt about this, I invite you to look at the lamb on the cross. What happened when the lamb was hanging? On the cross. He said. I am thirsty. And the people around him. Concluded. They wanted water. 
but he was thirsty of God's love. He was being separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the pain was indescribable. Intense. Only the wicked would have an idea of what Christ went on on the cross. The pain. And it was so intense that he finally said, oh my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Pain. Intense pain. The pain of knowing that you're going to be eternally separated from God. The lamb went through that for no other, or at least aiming at that, no other one would have to go through that. But the wicked chose to go through that. And there they are, looking at the lamb in pain for what they lost and their wickedness. Now, this is, this is really not new for us as Adventists. We have always taught, they, we have always taught that the final conflict, in, that in the final conflict, God's love will be triumphant. We have always thought that. And if you go to the book, The Great Controversy, page, I don't know, five, uh, 665 or 66, Ellen D. White describes the scene of the final judgment. And she says that, that when the wicked come, they are coming against the city, the throne of Christ is lifted up above the wall of the city and they look at him and she says behind him is the cross the cross that's what they see the loving sacrifice of God through his son this is the, the final judgment and the evidence that God brings to show to the wicked forces, forces of evil, the, the evidence. He has only one piece of evidence. He doesn't need anything else. In his cosmic law of court, court of law, God brings the evidence of his <laughs> the lamb. This is how much, how much I love you and the cosmos. And you rejected it. Can you imagine the pain? You rejected it. The gospel will be triumphant. And do you know what is going to happen? Good news, the cosmic conflict will be resolved in a peaceful way. The wicked will finally acknowledge that God is indeed God of justice and love. They will give glory to God. They will acknowledge that God is a Lord of love and justice. And they, including Lucifer, will bow down and worship and say, we deserve to die. Take our lives. We deserve. We have to die because we are so evil. We have to die. 
John anticipated that. I'm, I'm here in chapter 5. Chapter 5, Revelation, verse 13. Listen to this. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard them say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, are you listening? To the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's how the cosmic conflict finishes, ends peacefully. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every knee will bow down in heaven, on earth, under the earth. Every human, every being in the universe will bow down and acknowledge that God is a God of love and justice. And that the wicked deserve to die eternally. This is the message we proclaim. We have not been called to proclaim exclusively the mark of the beast, who the beast is. Yes, we have to proclaim that. But that's not the message. The message is the gospel. And in the process of proclaiming the gospel, we have to, to unmask the forces of evil, tell humanity that there is a false gospel, that they should not be deceived by that false gospel. But the message you have to proclaim, the message that you should take every week to the pulpit is Christ the Lamb. Everything you preach about has to, to revolve around the Lamb. May God bless you and bless me. As we proclaim the three angels' messages, three messages, one gospel. Go, proclaim. God bless you.